Next up on the virtual conference stage is Kitson Kelly, all the way from Melbourne in Australia. Kitson is a consultant with ThoughtWorks, as well as being a long-term contributor to the Dino runtime, a runtime that probably needs very little introduction nowadays. In this session, Kitson is going to be exploring why and how Dino treats TypeScript as a first-class language. This is sure to be a session that a lot of people will take a lot away from. If you're enjoying it, do let us know by posting on Twitter and don't forget to include the hashtag CityJS2021. And if you're watching along on GatherTown or in YouTube, please do keep your comments coming in in the relevant section. I hope you enjoy this talk. Kitson, it's over to you. Hello, Kitson Kelly here. I hope you are all uh, well and enjoying the conference so far. Uh, I'm coming to you from just outside Melbourne, Australia. Uh, one of the things we do in Australia at any public gathering is give an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Bunwarung people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am speaking to you from today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders listening or watching today. Uh, also paying my respects to your elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, Dino and TypeScript um, uh, and, and how they work together. Um, first, a little bit about me, uh, originally from uh, the US, uh, but moved to the UK in 2006, and then Australia in 2018. Um, my first contribution to Dino was the 31st of May, 2018. Uh, Roy's first commit was the 13th of May, so I've I've been there uh, for since effectively the beginning. Um, one of the big compelling events that got me involved in Dino was the birth of my son in August of 2018. Um, I needed something to do as a new dad uh, because I was just uh, sitting around taking time off, uh, spending time with him, um, and uh, well, you know, infants aren't uh, the most uh, 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 talkative at that age. Um, started working on Dino full time in September of 2020, and I've focused largely on the TypeScript, TypeScript integration to the Dino CLI. And more recently, I'm building a language server into the Dino CLI to give a, a sort of full, well-rounded uh, development experience in editors. Um, I also uh, wrote and maintain Oak, a middleware framework for Dino that is uh, sort of express or co-alike. Um, and um, uh, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with Dino, Dino is a command line runtime for executing JavaScript, TypeScript, and WebAssembly. It's built with Rust and V8. Um, uh, and some JavaScript as well. Um, and um, uh, ever since the beginning, uh, Dino uh, has uh, loved uh, and embraced TypeScript. Um, and one of our main objectives has been to treat TypeScript as a first class language in Dino, just like JavaScript and WebAssembly. That means with Dino, there's nothing to install or configure to run TypeScript, and TypeScript you run uh, will be type checked against the Dino specific APIs uh, and the supported web platform APIs that are that are uh, built into Dino. Um, as a side note, you can optionally have Dino uh, type check your JavaScript too if you want, um, so it it gives you the the full uh, experience. Um, some of you might be saying. Uh, uh, to yourselves, you know, you, you can't run TypeScript, uh, and you'd be right, but then you can't uh, directly run JavaScript or WebAssembly either. In the case of JavaScript and WebAssembly, the V8 engine translates the JavaScript and WebAssembly into opcodes, uh, which then runs on uh, a local machine's uh, processors. Uh, Dino just handles the next level of abstraction for TypeScript to JavaScript for you, um, and so, you know, it's kind of built in. Um, so what is TypeScript anyways? Um, well, personally, I like to think of it this way. Uh, there is the TypeScript language syntax, which is intended to be a fully erasable type system for JavaScript. Uh, there are a couple caveats about that, and there is some syntactical structures that were added to the language in the early days uh, that aren't valid JavaScript, uh, but it, it is mostly the case that if you just erase the TypeScript uh, types, uh, you get runnable JavaScript. Uh, then there is the TypeScript compiler, um, often referred to as TSC, uh, which is an integrated type checker and syntax emitter transpiler. Um, we directly embed the TypeScript compiler into Dino. 
the TypeScript compiler is distributed as JavaScript, though it's authored in TypeScript. Uh, when we build Dino, we load up the TypeScript compiler into a JavaScript runtime, along with some other Dino-specific code to manage the compiler and provide it access to the outside world. Uh, we then take a snapshot uh, of that runtime and rewrite it to disk. Uh, Dino will then lazily start up this snapshot when it needs to type check, uh, uh, type check TypeScript or, or JavaScript. Um, when you start running something in Dino, Dino will statically analyze all the dependencies of your code, um, fetching any remote modules uh, that you uh, might be in your code and populating them in the disk cache. Uh, so instead of a package manager in, in Dino that uh, goes and grabs your dependencies and installs them for you, uh, Dino does all of this itself and in your code you simply refer to um, the, the URL of the file you want to import, much like you would in a browser. Um, for any TypeScript by default, Dino will type check it. Um, it will then uh, transpile it from uh, TypeScript to JavaScript and place that into a disk cache as well. Uh, and finally, Dino loads the first JavaScript module into V8, and the V8 will start requesting the other modules it needs, which Dino will fetch uh, from the on-disk cache. So Dino basically gets everything ready, and the V8 I I um, uh, environment that's in Dino um, starts doing the same uh, sort of processing like it would do in your web browser or Node.js. Um, so, functionally making it easy for Dino to use TypeScript was pretty straightforward. You, embedding the uh, 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 TypeScript compiler, you know, that the, the, we, we had that going, you know, very, very early on uh, in the process. Um, and, um, but we had some issues and challenges along the way. Um, but most of those were ironed out early in the project, right? Um, uh, and the hard work became trying to get rid of the performance tax there uh, was in Dino for using TypeScript over JavaScript. Um, while Dino caches the output of a TypeScript file, it is still relatively expensive time-wise to type check a type, uh, a type, che type check TypeScript. And you know when you're doing development and you're rapidly making changes to a code base uh, or one of your dependency changes, you really start to notice this this sort of tax and and time there. Um, so we started benchmarking uh, Dino fairly early on, and uh, quickly the TypeScript tax became uh, important. We really noticed it. Um, we, you know, our own development, you know, was was one of those challenges. So we did everything we could think of to get the TypeScript compiler going as fast as possible, um, which appeared to be the real bottleneck. Uh, we made some wins there with doing all sorts of dark arts. As you can see from the simple TypeScript program, uh, we improved that speed by 50% by just sort of um, uh, doing this, that, and the other thing. The problem was uh, at uh, around 50 milliseconds, uh, this was 50 times slower than if someone did the same thing in just JavaScript under Dino. And having a 50 times tax for TypeScript uh, still didn't make us feel comfortable. Um, uh, and, and you know, we felt it would lead to people sort of not using uh, TypeScript as, as much. Um, and that kind of made us sad. So um, when we announced Dino 1.0, we threw down the gauntlet and said that we needed to move more uh, and more of the TypeScript compiler was doing into Java, from JavaScript in, into Rust. Um, I know it causes a bit of a stir in the community as a whole, um, but we have to. But we've made some significant strides over the last nine months or so. Um, uh, we realized that type checking was part of the problem, and that in a lot of cases, end users didn't necessarily need to uh, their TypeScript code to be type checked every time. Uh, especially if you were developing an IDE that was providing you the IntelliSense as you typed. Um, so we introduced the no check option into Dino. Initially, we simply told the TypeScript compiler to uh, skip type checking, um, but still do the parsing and emitting. Uh, you can see we have a significant amount of time in the June of 2020, um, but it's still not good enough. We we knew, um, and, and we knew that going in um, that that wasn't going to be good enough, but it, it was a start. So then we uh, introduced SWC, uh, which is a parser and emitter written totally in Rust. 
uh, we then integrated that uh, into the no check option. And as you can see the results in July of 2020, um, and you can see now we're getting some, some serious speed when, when you skip uh, type checking. Um, but we still knew that people would benefit from type checking their JavaScript and TypeScript, and it was still too slow. So we've continued to focus on intelligent ways uh, to move more and more of that out of the TypeScript compiler and into Rust. Um, we know uh, we we now uh, do all of the dependency analysis in Rust and resolve all the modules before we ever uh, start up the TypeScript compiler. Uh, we also get more and more intelligent about how we pre-populate stuff uh, for the TypeScript compiler, um, and um, we do the build snapshots. We do you know pretty much um, everything that we can think of. Um, in our opinion, it's still not good enough. Um, uh, you, you can see from this uh, uh, graph that um, you, you know there's still quite a bit of an overhead you know, if you uh, do some uh, type checking. Um, uh, and um, but I'm going to talk about some of those things later on. Well, just write it in Rust or WebAssembly or AssemblyScript or you know, and this came up a lot um, uh, when we started when we threw down the gauntlet, um, and every time it comes up, I I, I sort of lose it. Um, specifically, some people think there's a magic wand that you can wave over some JavaScript or TypeScript code and convert it into WebAssembly. There isn't. WebAssembly does not make JavaScript faster. V8 makes JavaScript uh, about as fast as theoretically possible. WebAssembly is great if you have some other memory allocated language like C++ or Rust, uh, which you want to move uh, uh, run under V8. Um, most of the time for us in Dino, if something is slow under JavaScript, we will write the hot paths in Rust or find a crate that does it for us. Um, when it's hard or difficult to, uh, to do it fully in Rust, uh, we can use WebAssembly. And there happens to be parts of Dino Standard Library that are written in WebAssembly. Um, but you don't convert JavaScript or TypeScript to WebAssembly, uh, which brings us to assembly script. Again, some people think you can just wave a magic wand and convert TypeScript to assembly script. You can't. AssemblyScript is a TypeScript-like syntax that compiles to WebAssembly. It basically makes it easier for those that are familiar with TypeScript to write WebAssembly. Which brings us to the last part. Why not write the TypeScript type checker in Rust? It would be so much faster, people say. Maybe. Um, but for various potentially valid reasons, um, uh, uh, the TypeScript uh, core team will always write TypeScript in TypeScript. Um, so rewriting the type checker in Rust would mean that if we wanted compatibility with the official TypeScript, we would have to maintain the Rust-based type checker ourselves and re-implement everything and keep it up to date. The maintainer SWC has been working on and off on a Rust-based type, uh, TypeScript type checker. It's interesting, um, and we collaborate closely with him. Uh, but I'm still personally of the opinion that there are still other ways to improve the experience before we go down the route that would be expensive and difficult to maintain. And again, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that more in the future. Um, and it would also potentially fragment the community. And, you know, th there's all sorts of challenges and problems with that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not really, it's not a short, uh, small program of work. Um, and I think we can do lots of other things um, uh, instead of going down that particular path. Um, but um, just getting TypeScript working and fast isn't everything you need to treat it as a first class language. Um, and um, uh, Dino has some pretty useful and powerful features which impact how TypeScript is handled. Um, uh, but also the wider development experience. So making it a first-class language means that you also need to be, ab a a be able to use it in a development environment. Um, uh, while some people are comfortable with just Notepad uh, and the Dino CLI, most of us uh, use a richer development environment, including myself. Um, and uh, so uh, we come to where I've spent the last little while of my focus building the the Dino language server into the Dino CLI and reintegrating that into the Visual Studio code extension for Dino. We released the extension mid-February and the Dino CLI has been shipping with a MVP uh, language server since the start of 2020, uh, but in sort of a dark and stealth mode. Um, 
uh, and originally we we've we focused on targeting uh, VS Code, um, but um, uh, the, we, we've done it in a way that we haven't tied ourselves exclusively to VS Code. Um, uh, about 90% of the work in the VS Code extension uh, is actually in the Dino language server. Um, the Dino language server provides the language server protocol, uh, which is the protocol specified by the Visual Studio Code team, uh, which has become the de facto standard for integrating editors and IDEs in the language server. This means that we can enable editors to access some of the very powerful features of Dino and get the same behavior in the Dino CLI uh, because it's coming from the Dino CLI itself. Um, our first attempt um, with the extension, uh, which started in the community and you know sort of became a, a official extensions, and uh, uh, as we sort of took that up, um, we were always in a bit of a, a, a arms race between the CLI um, because we would change things in the CLI and that wouldn't that would impact the behavior of the extension, and we have to go update the extension, and even the extension was somewhat imperfect because it could only observe stuff from outside of the CLI, um, where an integrated language server means that we can execute the same code in the same way uh, in the internals of Dino um, and, and ensure that that uh, development experience uh, uh, is consistent or it, it gives us the opportunity to make it consistent. Um, one of the main reasons we focused on the Dino language server is that it would really free up the community at large to enable other editors to integrate into Dino without having to reinvent everything. Already there's community integrations which you can find in the Dino manual under getting started and then uh, and, and then setting up your environment. So there's uh, I think there's a couple uh, for Emacs, um, there's a couple for Vim and uh, some of the other uh, flavors of, of Vim uh, out there, um, uh, I, I think there's just a, a general wide uh, community uh, ability out there. If some of them really get a lot of traction um, and the teams that are maintaining it think that it would be good for Dino to officially maintain it, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, or if you're working on an integration language uh, uh, server, I, I'd be glad to, to uh, talk to you and, and, and try to see how we can work better together. So um, what does the future ho hold? Um, there is a lot more we want to do with the Dino language server to provide a seamless experience between uh, using Dino a a on the CLI and developing code in the editor. Uh, many of those things would be coming rapidly over the next few weeks to months. Um, we've also started benchmarking the performance of the uh, Dino language server and so helping ensure that it continues to stay performant is a priority. Uh, because if your editor slows down, it is almost 10 times worse than waiting a few extra milliseconds for Dino to, to run your program. So. Um, uh, on how the C Dino CLI handles TypeScript, um, one of the things that I uh, want to personally push for, which I think will be su uh, supported by the rest of the core team, is that we stop using the TypeScript compiler to do the emit when we type check. Uh, my estimates are that we would save 10 to 20 percent of the time uh, in the medium TypeScript benchmark uh, that was earlier in the presentation uh, when doing a full type check. Well, it doesn't fully eliminate the TypeScript tax, uh, it would take another chunk out of it, which I think everyone would appreciate. Uh, the other longer term one, which keeps getting uh, put on the back burner for me, is that currently we type check um, about 20% of the time is spent by the TypeScript compiler doing the parse of the TypeScript code. Uh, when we use SWC to do the parse, uh, uh, we don't uh, when we don't type check, it's somewhere around 100 to 200 times faster than the TypeScript compiler. So if we took the parse uh, from the SWC and translated it in Rust to, par uh, to a parse which we could then send into the TypeScript compiler, uh, we might have a huge performance win. Uh, this would uh, lead effectively to the TypeScript compiler as a type checker only, which is exactly what it is best at doing. Um, the main reason that keeps getting put off is is because it's not a small investment of time um, because we'd have to take um, uh, th that parse um, and reshape it in a way that can be consumed by TypeScript. And then even then, we're not sure if 
it would really save all that sort of stuff. So one of these days, um, when I have spare time, uh, we'll try it. Um, try to do like an MVP, see if we can get the real simple program uh, to do it, and see what sort of speed improvement that we might be able to get to try to gauge whether it's in, uh, worth the the full investment. Um, so hopefully that gives you a view of Dino, uh, how it handles TypeScript, and some of the challenges and opportunities uh, there are to try to make TypeScript a first-class language under Dino. Um, I think there's a Q&A session after this, and I'll uh, be glad to talk to you um, and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference um, and um, uh, look forward to um, uh, seeing you online and, and elsewhere. Goodbye. Kitson, thank you very much for giving us that amazing talk all about Dino and TypeScript and showcasing us the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hopefully, everybody at home watching along has been inspired to introduce a little bit of Dino into their workflow. If you have already used Dino, why not let us know exactly what it is you've been using it for in the comments after you have put some of those little clap emojis into the chats which speaking of claps it must be time for another round the world round of applause now kitson will be joining myself in a q a over on gather town any moment now so please do head over to there if you are not watching along there and uh, be a part of it uh, we would love to see you there if you can't get into gather town because you haven't got your ticket and you for some reason don't want to go and buy one let us know what you thought of that talk in the youtube comments or on twitter using the hashtag cityjs2021 once again thank you very much kitson for that brilliant talk all the way from melbourne I've got to say, Kits, and these handovers are quite uh, professional, aren't they? It's almost as if we know what we're doing. I know. This is great. So, Kits, and first off, let me say thank you very much for that amazing talk. It was really, really informative. Um, I know our video guys have been sat there nodding along, so there must have been some good stuff in there. Um, for me, the most interesting part was the amount of sheer GIFs you used in your talk. <laughs> I love a talk with some GIFs. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your selection criteria for GIFs and how you came to use those ones? Well, I, yeah, I think I think um, I wanted GIFs because, hey, you know, you can't have enough of them in a talk. Um, and um, I... I I tried to, well, there were a couple of obscure ones in there. Um, and so, yeah, if, if people had to think about them, that was, that was, um, uh, uh there, to, uh, yeah, to, to try to at least begin to go, okay, why, why is that gift there? So, um, hopefully there were a couple of them that were a little bit cryptic. So. Good. We like, we like cryptic gifts. And I think <laughs> we've got a talk about cryptic subjects coming up later today or tomorrow. So, Cryptic seems to be a theme for the conference this year. Um, so something I wanted to touch on, and this is um, a reflection of the awesome state of JavaScript at the moment. I hear there is some good news for you. Apparently your intro was not quite right anymore, a little bit out of date. Do you want to share <laughs> the exciting news? Yeah, no, I, I I left ThoughtWorks in September of last year, actually, um, uh, to work on Dino full-time. So. Um, uh, there, there's there's probably an announcement at the end of the month, um, so just in a couple of days um, uh, about that. But um, uh, I've been I've been working on Dino full time for a few months now, um, and uh, with some other folks, um, which is a great opportunity. And the fact that we get to work on open source software um, and get paid to do it full time is is definitely a privilege. So I feel really privileged to to be able to actually do my passion and 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 earn my living that way so um but um yeah i think there's going to be uh, more stuff at the at the end of the month when when we kind of uh, start talking about it publicly oh, does this mean there's going to be a team coming out and come on you can tell us we won't tell anyone it's, it's just between <laughs> me and you there's nobody watching. well 
Yeah, no, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I, I think they'll, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to steal the, the thunder. So um, because uh, uh, some folks, I mean, uh, you know, we, we've got a few f folks that um, go back in time. So, you know, Rai, um, Ryan Dahl, um, uh, Bert Bedler, um, uh, Ben Norhus, um, you know, we're all uh, core parts of the Node.js community, um, and they're all part of what we're doing next. Um, and then there's a few of us that are that are kind of relatively young on the scene. So, um, uh, you know, very exciting, and and hopefully, um, uh, hopefully, we'll we'll make a bit of a splash uh, in nice. a couple of days. It uh, must be a nice feeling to be able to call yourself young to a scene. Um... Yeah, well, yeah, because I'm not young in any other aspect. So, yeah, I'm. I, I think I'm one of the. I think I'm the oldest, actually. So, um, well, I think you should start counting birthdays from when you became a full-time Dino contributor. Okay, there we <laughs> start go. At, you're starting at one this September coming. <laughs> um, so I'll just check and see whether any questions come through. Not yet. Um, so with uh Dino, the thing that you know, we've kind of touched on this already. The thing that really excites me about the community that's building up around it, it seems to be going about things differently. So you've said that you're going into being a full-time paid contributor to Dino. It might be my lack of knowledge, but that's not a typical thing for open source software, is it? Um, no, I mean, and I, I think I think a lot of that is uh, when Rai started this again, um, having you know had the experience that he had with you no know, JS and Giant, um, and kind of knew what he liked and what he didn't like. Um, it was it was great to have somebody who's who's had that sort of experience. Um, you know, and Bert had his experience um, through Strong Loop uh, and and that organization, um, and so they 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 knew what they liked and what they didn't like, um, and that. Uh, you know, like one of the core things was like, well, having it be uh, a, a sideshow where your day job is something else wasn't going to work. Um, you know, having it in a situation where you, you didn't have a, a, a company focused on it behind it, right? You, you know, the giant was using it as a uh, originally, you know, using Node.js as, as a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a little you know, little shiny thing in the window to, to attract other business, right? Um, and I think there's other organizations that, that have done other things. And then there's the large, you know, organizations like the Microsofts and the Googles who can, you know, sink loads of resources into um, what are, you know, sort of uh, experiments, but there, there's very few that are sort of in between. Um, so it's it's sort of exciting that we, we've we got something that's going to, you know, kind of continue to focus on it's it's core bit um uh and um you know but be able to 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 make something of it um versus you know just sort of it being the open source bit being the sideshow so hmm. sounds like a dream team you said that you touched on excitement there i think for me dino is one of the few things to have come along in the last couple of years that's genuinely got people excited um about the product a in terms of what it does and also the way it's being managed and handled do you think that op other open source projects moving forward are going to be able to kind of piggyback off of the back of that excitement you know is this going to be the typical way that we see open source coming nowadays yeah i don't know um uh, it, it it's increasingly getting hard for me because like I'm so buried in the little ecosystem that we have, right? Um, and you know, it's like even my side projects, are, you know, are suffering because of the the uh, focus of of everything on on um, uh, sort of Dino at the moment for me. Um, and so it's like I, there's even stuff happening in the wider bit that I is just passing me by, um, and. Um, uh, so I, I think I'm I'm personally kind of losing a bit of touch with that. On the other hand, hopefully, hopefully people, hopefully there are organizations that aren't 
you know, big, large enterprises, you know, and that there are venture capitalists, there are investors who begin to see that investing directly in open source um, is, is something that can, you know, deliver things, right? You know, we don't need the, you know, the 20th social media platform to take on Facebook, right? You know, we really need to invest in, in some of these core uh, tools and, and, and software to help pull us forward, or it'll simply all be owned by the domain by a few large corporates. And, you know, they've done, you know, you, you look at Microsoft and Google and, uh, and, and that, and they've done, you know, really great things. And you look at that, you know, um, you know, Microsoft's starting to pick up some of the weight that that you know Mozilla had to shed because they haven't been able to uh, to to make it work. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it would be sad if just a few large technology companies sort of owned the open source world, right? Um, uh, and so, hopefully, you know that. Yeah, but on the other hand, people maintaining stuff as their side job. Um, uh, and not getting paid for it is is just not sustainable, right? There's so much in the open source community where people are giving of their time and they're not being compensated for it. So, um, uh, and and then you have all of these other non-technology corporations that use the the outcome of that um, and profit off of it, um, but never give anything back to 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 those um, uh, to those open source projects, right? So. <sighs> Yeah, it's a quandary, isn't it? So you said there about investment. If you had half a million uh, dollars, which open source project would you invest it into, not including Dino? Um, oh, you're on the spot there. Yeah. The, well, the, there's the well, um, the, there are well, ones that uh, I would throw more money at Rust. <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, Rust is probably going to be, you know, continue to get m more money, you know, so they, they've, they, they seem to have gotten themselves into a good situation after sort of, uh, the, you know, post Mozilla, um, uh, world. Um, uh, but I think, you know, Rust is, is going to continue to be hugely influential in, in the world over the next, you know, a bit, right? It's going to, you know, the world, JavaScript ate the world and Rust is now coming along and, and eating the other half of the world that, that JavaScript hasn't eaten, right? Um, uh, and um, uh, so uh, on the other hand, there's, you know, there's something that we use heavily in, um, I just don't know if... I, if I had the half a million and didn't expect to make money off of it, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a that that's the difference. Is is there? There's tons of of projects that deserve good money, right? Um, and one that we continue to uh, benefit from uh, in Dino Land is uh, SWC, which is a a, a, a Rust based uh, transpiler for JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, and and you know like. You know, those are projects that really probably should have teams of five, you know, 20 people working on them full time. It's got one uh, person uh, in Korea and he's brilliant and he works his butt off. Um, but that's about it. Right. Um, and the, there's there's lots of these little projects around there um, that are one person who it isn't even their day job and they're killing themselves, uh, you know, the, every night. So, um, maybe I just spread, spread it as, as, uh, as much as I could. Okay. Uh, off of the back of that, I'm going to set a challenge for the audience watching along at home. Um, go and find one of your favorite open source projects, which is maintained by a very small team and go and thank the person who's making it because that will make a huge difference to their motivation. You might not have half a million quid to give them, but a thank you is free. And I know that people will appreciate that. Um, we have had a question come in, um, and this one is from Dominic. For the moment, how does Dino compare to Node.js, particularly around HTTP and web requests? Yeah, so um, uh, so I, I think Dino dot land slash benchmarks. Um, you can actually see comparisons there, um, uh, and I may Dino dot land 
and there's a link on the benchmark because I can't remember if that's the right URL or not. Um, but um, uh, we aren't as good as we want to be. Um, and this has been a long uh, conversation um, at the moment. We, we thought that we would be able to implement uh, most of the HTTP handling in um, uh, JavaScript, um, that's just not really proven itself uh, over the last year and year and a half. Um, so we are, and I can't remember the exact timeline for this, but relatively soon going to move all of that into uh, Rust um, and only provide the, the, the sort of uh, uh, bindings um, that, you know, a, a bit of a surface area within um, uh, Dino. At that point, we we know it's going to be um, or an order of magnitude faster than than Node.js. Um, uh, it should be really fast as well as it'll deliver HTTP2 in quick, um, uh, which are something that we don't support at the moment, um, which is probably the second or third most uh, wanted feature out of uh, Dino at the moment. Okay. I'm interested now. What is the first and second most wanted feature? Um, I think we delivered the first. Let me, uh, let me, uh, let me Google real quick. Um, We've got our first live Googling session, folks. Yeah. Because uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked in a little while of what uh, sort by... Oh um, yeah, so the, the 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 first one is is they they the, is continued support for getting more and more of the TypeScript compilation in Rust, um, which I can talk about at length. There's quite a bit of support for Node compatibility. The standard library already has um, uh, quite a, a bit of their uh, of compatibility APIs uh, for Node.js, um, and it's one of the things that we kind of continue to focus on. Um, number two is actually Docker support, so um, we still don't have an official Docker image. It's one of those things. Um, and then it looks like TypeScript support and the uh, and the REPL is, uh, which is just one of those frustrating things that it's harder to do than you think it would be. Um, mm. So we keep putting it off and then, yeah. And then we get to like HTTP two uh, and quick um, and 32 bit arm processors. For some reason, people want to run uh, uh, um, uh, Dino on their Raspberry Pis for some reason, but. Fair enough, each to their own, each to their yeah. own. Um, I'm I'm slightly surprised that you don't have an official Docker image. If I'm honest, um, is that just because you haven't got around to it yet, or it's just keeps trickling down the priority list? I think it's it, it, there. There was good community effort on it, and so we've not needed to um, really step in and, and focus on that. Um, partly. Yeah, and and then there there's still a long a long term debate too. Is is like for example, is it is it Alpine and Ubuntu, um, and it it's kind of like one of those things where the community seems to largely, and it's something the community can do. Um, so why why interfere? Even though people kind of would like. Yeah, like the officially stack. blessed and sanctified, but yeah, we'll get around to it eventually. I think that, that that's a testament to the strength of the Dino community that they've gone ahead and built those Docker images and have got them out there for people to use. It's uh, really good. Hats off to you all if you've contributed to that. Digital hats, uh, <laughs> pretend hats as well. <laughs> Excellent. So I think we've got five more minutes. Um, is there anything you want to rabbit on about at length? Um, before we get to our rapid fire questions, anything you want to make sure you've slipped into the stream and put into people's heads? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's late at night. You just yeah. get off this I mean, day, don't you? <laughs> I mean, I, I talked about it in the talk, but yeah, and this is where my head is, is, you know, we're really going to try to um, 
uh, improve the development experience by really enabling a you know the a good IDE integration, right? Um, uh, because we think that that's like that's really important. So you know, like things that I've been working on in the past couple of days. Um, you know, have been things like import completions, and I'm just about to get um, the bit of of um, being able to, um, like in Visual Studio Code, point at a package registry. So that I mean, that's one of the things that you know, you know, we we want to continue to be open, right? We don't want you to have to lock into a package registry from one company you know um that's controlled you know by a private company that that you, you know you, you do that so we we had um uh, previously sort of set up a specification that allowed uh, us to discover uh, a package registry um, and be able to uh, be able to easily import that into your IDE um, because we've moved everything over to a language server that's actually embedded in the Dino uh, command line um, that integration is going to be even tighter in the sense that um, we'll go fetch those modules for you uh, put them in your cache you know the, so you could almost argue that your IDE becomes your package manager um, because Dino doesn't have one um, uh, and and um, give you that ability to sort of explore um, uh, and discover packet, you know, uh, modules that you can use in Dino without um, uh, without needing a package manager, right? Having it actually be part of the the um, the, the whole uh, command line uh, program. I mean, that sounds amazing, <laughs> completely amazing. So no more npm installs or the, the Dino equivalent anymore. All in the yeah, well, there, there never has been an NPM install because it's just modules. You just type in the URL of the module that you want, right? But discovery becomes a little bit more difficult. Like, like what module do I want to, uh, URL do I want to use, right? So being able to do that discovery within your IDE so that when the module ends up being in your code, right? You know, so dependencies is code. There's no package JSON. You know, it, it, um, uh, in Dino, it's you, all your dependencies are as dependency as code. So, no package, Jason. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are going to be very grateful to hear that. <laughs> so, I've got a super quick question that's come in from the audience, um, as well as a few thank yous, by the way. Um, at today, at this moment in time, what type of project would you recommend? people reach for Dino for? Is it a straight swap for Node.js? If they were going to reach for Node, they could reach for Dino instead? Or uh, I'm probably too critical of it, right? Because I, I mean, I, it depends on, so like I've, I've created a web framework uh, a web server framework that's sort of expressed um, Koa is more Koa like, right? Um, called Oak. Um, there are a lot of people running uh those middle middleware type web servers um uh under dino right um and you can write it all in typescript if you're a fan of typescript you can write it in javascript if you're a fan of javascript um and that, those are relatively painless to do the other thing that a lot of people are doing that would be a differentiator from node.js is um there's the dino.emit API, um, which basically is a built-in uh, JavaScript and TypeScript transpiler for you. Um, and so there are a lot of people that are creating servers that transpile TypeScript on the fly um, using that API, which is basically, the, it hooks you into the Rust uh, parts and pieces of of Dino, right? Um, without having to to do all of that in 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 JavaScript, right? So you can do your TypeScript tech checking, you know, using TSC, which is built in, you know, built into Dino, right? Um, so there's a lot of a lot of people are um, doing crazy innovative things with with that that I never thought that they would do when we added those APIs, right? Which is the great thing, right? People doing crazy stuff that you didn't envision, right? Um, which means they break it in strange ways too. Like somebody raised an issue where they had over um, 560 megs of diagnostic errors from their TypeScript 
uh, file <laughs> and wow. it broke it broke do you know <laughs> it couldn't it couldn't handle uh, the and so i've got to go fix it in a way that it doesn't break anymore it, but cool. um, don't have 560 megs of errors that's good and um, we are right up against the end of our time so thank you very much for your time i have one parting question for you sure tabs or spaces ah spaces i used to be tabs but spaces now the, the beauty of two spaces is has won me over it's it's simple isn't it brilliant yeah. and on that bombshell we will call time on this thank you very much for your time kitson for both the talk okay. and this q a and we'll leave you to the rest of your night in melbourne australia okay thank Thanks you very much, much.